Thanks, guys. We can take this.
Thank you for the chance to be together as a church today. In Jesus' name, amen. I was thinking this week, I was preparing for this topic. You know, we live in a, a wild world, truly a wild world, where baby animals are often more valued than baby humans, where people groups are simply viewed as voting blocks, even by those who claim to fight for them. We live in a world where small town America, where you and I live, is often derided. We live in a world where prison systems put women in danger from biological men who claim to be women. We live in a world where young people are bullied, prejudice is still seen. We live in a world where disabled people are often neglected, hidden, and shunned. We, all, we live in a world where people with higher IQs are put on a platform above others and considered better. We live in a world where those with academic degrees are deemed more valuable to society than those without. We live in a world where people with more money or influence or power play by a different set of rules than the quote unquote common person. We live in a wild world. Now, I, I, my premise to you today is that there is a unifying truth that lies at the heart of a lot of these things that are wrong and cause confusion. There, there's confusion around one of the most fundamental truths about human beings. There is a rejection of the first words that God spoke about mankind in Scripture, and it is this. Genesis 1, 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Today's going to be the first of a couple topical series we're going to do this summer about being made in God's image. Today we're going to talk about how being made in God's image brings value to the human being. But first we need to step back and lay some context that and understand that this message, being made in God's image, is a unique message. So let me unpack a couple ideas around this and foundational. <coughs> First, when I say man, or what I'm using in the general sense, to refer to all of humankind, both male and female. Because that's what scripture uses here. It refers to all of human beings as mankind. Please hear that every human, male and female, are made in the image of God. Secondly, the idea of being made in the image of God is something Similar to the idea of being made in the likeness of something. What image God is basing humanity off of when he created us? What is that image? The answer is his own image. We are made in his likeness, his pattern. He serves as the template for our creation. Now this concept of image or likeness is important for us to consider because we define ourselves and we define others by the image we create of them, don't we? For instance, if someone were to paint your image, what do you think that painting would look like? That's how you image yourself. If someone were to create a fictional character in a book based upon who you are, what would that character be like? Who would they be? That's how you image yourself. And those images we create about ourselves define us. The images we create of others are how we define them. Image is similar to likeness. Thirdly, it is a big deal in Scripture when God creates man and he creates him in his image. In the creation story, the creation historical story, we see this pattern, right, that you can read. Uh, and then God said, then let there be, and he makes something, and it was so, and it was good, the first or second deep and dead. But when he gets to humanity, there, there's this, this clear pattern gets twisted and Broken in a little bit. And notice the differences, right? And God said, let us make. He personalized it, right? Not let there be. That's an impersonal proclamation of creation. Now it's let us make. And instead of saying it was so, he gives mankind blessing and dominion. He looks at mankind and looks at the all the stars and all the animals and all the beautiful things we see and calls them good. He creates humanity, creates mankind and says it was very good. Something special about us. Sixth day, and then it was finished. It was rest. We are the pinnacle of creation. We are something unique in all creation. The image of God sets man and woman apart from everything else that God made. We have incredible value <coughs> by that because we are made in His image, and we alone are made in His image. <coughs> Images are important. They communicate meaning. They communicate value. They communicate purpose. Images are important. They define 
and shape us. And by the way, a little side note, this is part of the reason why God is so intensely focused on images. He tells them not to make false images. And the golden calf is this incredible false image, right, that, that causes the death of thousands of people. He says, you need to create the right images for yourself. In fact, no image other than me, because images shape us. They define us. They give us purpose. Don't image after, don't image something to worship that is made by your own imaginations or some of the influence of a demon. We are made in God's image. There is no other image to which we bow down and make allegiance to. Images are important. They communicate meaning, value, and purpose. Images define and shape us. And all the scriptures teach that we are made in God's image. And this is a unique message, brothers and sisters. Um, if, if, if you have never looked into this, it's worth some time of your study. Look up ancient Near Eastern literature at some point. In ancient Near Eastern literature is the writings of like Egypt, Mesopotamia, Iran, or Persia. These ancient writings that, that, are, right, that are coming alongside of Scripture, right? Scripture is written, the Old Testament Scripture is written in context. And you get to see the uniqueness and beauty of something when you can set it against its context, right? You look at Old Testament and you kind of see it. But wait till you see the Old Testament compared to the Egyptians writing on wisdom. The Persians understanding of God and creation. Then you get to really see some beautiful points of how the Old Testament in some ways is similar, but in other ways is dramatically different than the rest of the wisdom that the world offers, the ancient world offers. For example, the image of God is actually found in other regions. This idea of the image of God is not unique to Scripture, but there's a fundamental and dramatic difference in how it plays out. Let me give you an example. In Egypt, the Pharaoh was made in the image of God. He was the image of God on earth, but he alone was. Nobody else in the land of Egypt was made in the image of God other than the Pharaoh. You are blessed, sir. You are not in the image of God. And what do we see in Scripture? Right? We see in Scripture, the Old Testament, that every human being is made in the image of God. Every human being. The Old Testament is a beautiful thing because it elevates every human being in the equality of each other. There are nobody set apart and higher in terms of reflecting in God's image. Images are important. They communicate meaning, value, and purpose. Images shape and define us. And the scriptures teach that we are all, all made in God's image. And this is a unique message. What does it mean to be made in God's image, though? What's, what does it mean? Because we, we wrestle with right? Get practical. What does it look like? And people throughout history have kind of looked at this and come up with a couple different theories on what it looks like. So let me tell you a couple things that it's not. These are incomplete truths. First, being the image of God is not our bodies. Having two arms and two legs and a head and ten fingers and toes, generally, does not make us the image of God. Secondly, it's not our function. The image of, we are not in the image of God because we rule over creation. Though some have theorized that. Others, like Karl Barth, have that it's our experiences, it's our relationships that make us in the image of God. We are in the image of God and we have a relationship with each other, specifically members of the opposite sex. That brings us into the image of God. And that's incomplete as well. What I would like to put forward today is the view of, it's called the substantive, substantive view about our substance. That you and I, in our substance, I know, we laugh. It was a good picture, but I, you know, had to go that um, <laughs> Classic one we need to go. Y'all went to quick the first thing they said. What did you do with that guy that laid down there? <laughs> this view is put forward by Emmanuel Kant, which says human dignity, being made in the image of God, is inherent to our nature, to our very substance. Your very substance is made in the image of God. And he goes on to say, look, the essence of things is not altered by their external relations. The essence of things is not altered by its external relations. Let me give you an example. Uh, a nail is a nail. Whether it's sitting in a box with other nail or whether it's hammered into a piece of wood, it is, in essence, still a nail. It's not the way it's used or its function does not alter its essence of what it is. So, that, that, so he uses that to leverage get some of these other views, right? It's not about the relationship we have with each other or with creation that makes us in the image of God, but that's often included in the image of God. It's part of our image. But 
That's not what makes us in the image of God. It's about our essence. It's the unique characteristics and qualities of being human. And what are those? A couple different things to be added to this list, but this is a general consensus. Uh, first, mental capacity. Parentheses choice, right? We have a higher mental capacity, worlds above anything else in creation. And with that is a unique degree of choice. We'll talk more about that in the end of July. Morality. A moral compass and a sense of God's holiness and a sense of a right and wrong put in us. Humanity does not function as the survival of the fittest as we see in the animal kingdom. Might does not make right. That is unique to human beings. This moral purpose put inside of us. And secondly, social beings. There's a relationship in them. The capacity for unique relationships between human beings compared to the rest of creation. The capacity for relationship with God compared to the rest of creation that no animal, nothing else in creation has the image, has the relationships that we do. It's part of our substance that makes us in the image of God. Now I want to point out here that the image is corrupted. Right? We look at things like mental capacity, and you know, some at birth are due to, due to an event of their life that's lost, some or much of their mental capabilities. It doesn't make them less in God's image or less valuable in the eyes of God. The idea here that the fall does corrupt the image, doesn't it? As we sin and live in a sinful world, you and I, the image of God is corrupted. That's the will of grace. It restores image. It restores who we are. It's one of the reasons why you read like Ephesians 4, 21, or Colossians 3, 10 to put on your new self. That's a new image, right? What's the image you would see in, in a painting? What's the image or the character that would be in a book? What God calls us to is to put on the new self. Set aside the former image of yourself and claim again the image that God had intended for you. Put on the new self. The one made perfectly in God's image and called fair and good. Now, you might be trapped with me thinking, man, we're kind of like lost in the weeds here a little bit. What does that have to do with value? But I thought, man, on a day like today, when we start this topic of being made in the image of God, we need to lay some foundation. That first, every human being is made in God's image or his likeness. And this is a message you need to scripture. That was point one. And here, that our image is contained in our substance. Not our bodies, our relationships, or our function. It's inherent in every human being's substance that they're made in God's image. And that turns us to the idea of value. Of value. That each and every one of us have incredible value to the Lord. And you can see it, right? When you look at the Genesis account and a couple other passages, let us make man in our image. Out of everything, God says, man, this is who I am. Let me reflect that and use that Trinitarian God, perfect holiness, perfect in righteousness, otherness, to create humanity in our pattern of likeness. That's a powerful truth. He breathes into us the breath of life. Right? Out of all creation, he just says, let it be so, and it's animated. For human being, he shapes us and breathes into us. His very breath gives us life. Genesis 3.21, when Adam and Eve sinned and are naked and ashamed, not naked and afraid. <laughs> In the TV show. <clears throat> what does God do? He kills animals and skins them so that Adam and Eve shame would be covered and they'd have protection from the elements. We're set apart. We're vital than the rest of creation. The first animal I've taken in the world is probably taken by God's hand for our sake. Matthew 6, 26, Jesus saying, do not worry. Do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, drink, what you'll wear. And he says, look out in the birds. You never reap. They don't sow nor reap. They don't gather goods into barns, and yet your heavenly Father provides for them. And he says, are you not more vital than they? God looks at us and very clearly gives us the value unique in all of creation. And maybe the most important symbol of our value is the one behind us and in front of us all the time. The symbol of the cross. Now I mention these verses and I share them because this is an important truth. And look, today might be the day where you're like, Duh. Like elementary, my dear Watson, I know all this stuff already. But we live in a world that doesn't. And my 
guesses that we have allowed to some degree in our lives, <coughs> the lives of the world, to, to shape our view of human value. For instance, we live in a world that is rampant with the belief in Darwinism, in Darwin, Darwinian evolution. Right? You know that, that, we, that we came from uh, some type of protein to single cell animal or single cell being to, to human. And there's links along the chain and adaptation of species, right, and evolution. One of the most derided, and you could argue it maybe shouldn't be as derided, derided times of the Western world is the imperial age or the colonial age. Right? Where you know, this would, the sun never set on the British Empire, this little island had America, and it had India, and it had China, and it had, you know, like it was everywhere, right? The sun never set on the British Empire. You know, you know what led to imperialism? What what the leading thinkers, how the leading thinkers justified it? And there's a lot of factors, right? And greed and then good intentions. And, but what, what the leading thinkers did was justify colonialism because of Darwinism. It was called social Darwinism. And they just tried to apply this theory of evolution into our modern world. They said, look, if, if, the, if the species evolves and adapts and changes, let's look at the human race and notice, wow, in the Western world, there's a difference of intelligence and culture and industry and color between us and other parts of the world. So clearly, we must be superior. Therefore, we must be more evolved. And so the loving thing to do for the Western world is to go and colonize the other worlds and bring our culture. Again, you might take great contention with that point. That's not what, that's not what I'm trying to make here. My point is... Modern society looks at imperialism and social Darwinism and calls it a great evil, while still holding on to the very same worldview that gave rise to it. What we've done is say, that Darwin's theory of evolution logically leads us to a place that secular morality doesn't want to go. So instead of questioning the premise behind it, they just rejected the outcome and now live with this internal conflict or inconsistency, an inconsistent worldview. If we are nothing more than evolved animals, then a theory like Darwinian evolution makes perfect sense. We still reap the devastating consequences in history and today. For instance, we live in a world that in many instances values animal life more than human life. I find it incredibly fascinating how you can look in the last 20, 30 years, we ascribe increasingly human traits to animals and increasingly animal traits to humans. Let me give you an example. Um, I remember this, uh, watching this, this narrator talking about the whales in the ocean. You know, we, and it's good. We can, we can appreciate the increasing complexity and nature of animals. Like, I'm not questioning that premise. But it's actually talking about how, how socially evolved the whales are and how, you know, how they're so sophisticated and magic, you know. And I'm thinking, you're looking at whales swimming in the ocean like they've done for hundreds of thousands of years while you're sitting in a submarine with a robotic camera broadcasting this around the world. Like, like, let, let's just call it what it is here. Like, you're nowhere near them. And they're talking about, like, they have human traits and social families and social structures. And I'm like, well, let's, come on, let's, maybe, but there's a world of a difference between elevating animals. My even wife's a veterinarian. And it's amazing the stuff that she hears, right? I was approved to send these messages by my wife. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, this, I'm sorry, I'm just asking for approval. But or let me go on the other side. We look at human beings and how they react to things, right? They say, well, that's just the way they're born. Well, they're, it's just how they, you know, we, we pass off human choice and responsibility to situations, to nature, and so we're lower. And the view of so many human beings right now is that you're less, that you're just a slave to the system structure, way you're born, your culture, like, like, no, we're better than that. We're not just instinctual creatures enslaved to our environment situation. We have choice. We have human dignity. We give increasingly human traits to animals and increasingly animal traits to humans because the root view is that we are not made in the image of God. We are simply evolved animals. There's a lot of application for this. We have forgotten that we alone are crafted by the hands of God, not the will of God. 
We alone have the breath of God in us that gives us life. We alone are given the faculties of a relationship with God. We alone are given responsibility and authority over creation. We alone are tasked with naming creation. We alone are worth of God sending his son to die on the cross for our rescue. We are forgetting him, but we fear not. What does this have to do with our relationship with each other? Right, a, couple of, a couple of applications. The fact that human beings have incredible values should change their view of others. Again, another simple statement that I, and I'm guessing you all agree with already, that each human being has innately, due to their creation, respect and dignity and value. Now, I need a caveat this because there's a twist to this teaching, right? I mean, not every good lie of Satan is a twist to the truth, right? And so what I'm not saying is that every human being being made in the image of God and having value removes consequences of sin and choice. In fact, I would argue that God, even under the covenant of grace, still allows consequence of sin and choice. He removes the ultimate consequence for those of us who have chosen to accept his grace and walk in that or respond to his call depending on the theology there. The removal of consequences is how this message gets twisted. So my point is this. When bad choices are made, we must discipline with dignity. We discipline with dignity for the good of the one needing discipline, to learning the consequence of decisions, and to honor and protect the victim of sinful choices and bad choices, right? So again, image God, every human being is, but it doesn't mean there's not discipline with dignity, okay? But let's move on. Back to the point at hand. The point is that every human being is made in the image of God, which means there's a couple things that don't affect your value, right? You can, put, you can probably put some other things on this list, but ability. Physical body function does not affect your value before the Lord, and it should not affect your value. Power, positional authority does not affect your value. Faculty, that's mental ability. Your IQ, your smarts does not affect your value. Position, achievement, color, wealth, age does not affect your value or dignity. Thus, Christians we value every human being. We value those that society often overlooks, right? So, I mean, a couple classics here, but like one of the un unborn babies who are not really considered human beings, despite the obvious truth in science. Babies who are morally innocent and do not deserve death under any situation. We value that life. We value the elderly. When many, and we have an increasingly secular Europe, we want to see where America's heading, we'll look at Europe, right? They're just, you know, a couple generations beyond us and has moved to secularism, unless the church steps up and things change. And look at our most secular cities, how they responded to the elderly during COVID. It's incredibly clear. In these, in, as we go more secular, the elderly are less valued. We have right to die laws in Europe in some of our leading, uh, some of our biggest, most secular U.S. cities. Right to die laws say that you have the right to have a doctor kill you. We have nowhere. It's, it's common in Europe. These, in this right to die law devalues human beings. First, this is a suicide robs people of compassion by robbing them of care. Second, we see over and over again that right to die becomes a duty to die. You see that happening in Europe consistently. Third, it destroys trust in doctors. And finally, not every terminal diagnosis is accurate. We, if we continue to walk away from being made in the image of God, we continue to devalue the elderly. We also devalue the mental disabled, mentally disabled. Instead of seeking to provide long-term good care for those with mental disabilities, well, what I often see and I hear from people who are struggling with family members who have mental disabilities is they medicate and send them on their way. Mental, this mentally disabled. In Belgium, you can kill a born baby. You can kill a born baby in Belgium if it has a disabled disability. The baby comes out and has, and what, what disabilities count? Well, I don't know the, all the details for Belgium, but in Britain, you can legally abort babies with Down syndrome, cleft lip, or cleft foot. Maybe comes out with a cleft lip, potential is you can kill them. Because they're disabled in some way, shape, or form. We don't hold to that. That is dishonoring the value that God has given to each and every human being. Mental dis the mentally disabled. We live in a society that instead of speaking truth and love to those struggling with mental illness and to provide care that honors the image of God in them, instead we simply medicate or affirm the mental illness for the sake of political agenda. 
I took master's level classes at a Christian university that told me how to counsel people with disabilities and that been mental disorders where I found that I was not supposed to provide any answers. I'm just supposed to sit and listen and let them discover. What an unloving thing to do. My point is, can we look at each person around you and see that they're made in the image of God? With incredible work and value, no exceptions. Can we, be, can we as Christians be the protectors of the weak and vulnerable in our society? Again, a truth that you probably most often read. Can you look out and see the image of God in your brothers and sisters? Just as I look out and look at you and say, man, is Roger really made the image of God? I, mean, I question that sometimes. <laughs> Logan is Tim, right? Are my brothers in the Lord, are my sisters in the Lord? Really made in the image of God. So here's the next place I want you to look. It's in the mirror. The image of God means you've got to be yourself that way too, doesn't it? Which means your value is not tied to ability, power, faculty, position, achievement, color, wealth, and age. Do you really believe that? And this is where, like, the image of God, right? I mean, we, we talk about the social truth a lot, and I think most of us get it. Like, I'm probably, you know, not being very contentious when I'm saying we should value every human being made in the image of God. But I think this truth becomes really powerful and kind of gut checks most of us when we turn into the mirror and say, I need to view myself with the same degree of value that God views me. A value that's not tied to anything on this list. That's an incredibly powerful, gut checking, and ultimately freeing truth. It's the message of the gospel of grace. That you are made in the image of God. It doesn't matter how capable you are, how, how much physical ability you have. It doesn't matter how much power you might achieve in the world or how smart you are. I read some, I read some article this last week about like a four-year-old that's in Mensa. I'm like, crap. You know, like, I'm kind of an idiot compared to that four-year-old. The good news is I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I don't have to be to be valued and loved by God. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be, you know, whatever to be valued. You don't have to achieve great things in your life, right? Success is faithfulness. Just be faithful to the Lord. Let the result matter to Him. Your color, your wealth, your age does not matter. You don't have to have a lot of money to be valuable to God and useful for His kingdom. That's an incredibly powerful and free truth. And you might look at me and say, yeah, that's a good truth, and you know, I should probably work on that. But let me let you in on your little secret. You can't actually value others the way that they're supposed to be valued if you don't view yourself the way you're supposed to be viewed. Right? Because if you view yourself in the mirror and you're judging yourself on those ways, that's your heart. Right? And out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of your heart, you act. So if you really want to value people, Every human being is made in the image of God with equal value and dignity. That must mean you have to do it to yourself, or, at, or you are like the secular world with a massive disconnect and a conflict in your worldview. This says, I can view you and look at you in a completely different way than I look at you. And if you don't view yourself that way, you will somehow be viewing others in the way that you should be viewing them. Does that make sense? You're, live your life honoring the dignity and value of others and yourself. Every human being is made in the image of God with value and dignity and worth, even the one that looks back at you in the mirror. Let me give you one application of viewing yourself this way. My, whole, my, my point here is to live into your value. That holiness in Scripture elevates the value of human beings. Sin consistently undercuts the value of human beings. When we sin, we corrupt God's image of squander. When we sin, we take this beautiful image and we start marking on it. We start coloring it up. Right? And, and marring the image. Sin mars the image. It paints it. We live below our dignity. Sex outside of marriage. There's a couple of things. You're going to apply this to almost anything, but here's a couple. Sin or sex outside of marriage lessens value because suddenly you're not valuable enough to be given the honor of commitment, security, and safety before sex. You lower yourself. You lower your dignity by being willing to give what's most intimate about yourself without the commitment that you deserve. 
Women need to be here this especially. I was having a conversation with a couple ladies this week, and we just bemoaned the fact that women empowerment has turned into sexualization of women. That's not what it's all about. That's not women empowerment. Pursuing addiction in any form lessens your value by making you a slave to someone. Be it hard drugs or, or nicotine or alcohol or caffeine or sugar or whatever, being addicted to something lessens your dignity and value. A life of luxury and entertainment, the sin of laziness and slothfulness in Scripture, lessens your value because you're spending your life on nothing of value instead of doing the important and valuable work that God has for you. And I can go on. Every sin that you commit in some ways undercuts the dignity and value of the other or of yourself. The righteous and holy life that God has for us is a life of dignity and value and honor of others and yourself. Live into your value. Live into your dignity. So, so that you're not more entertaining. And so that by his grace, right, you can clean the pain. And by his grace, you can remove the scars of sin and be restored to the image that you're supposed to be. So let me recap. First point, scripture teaches a unique message that we are made in the image of God. Second, that image is tied to our substance. That each person has a built in, no exceptions. Thirdly, we are uniquely and especially valuable, each and every human being. So we live looking out at the other as though they are dear and valuable to God, worthy of dignity and honor. And we live looking in the mirror as a lion and worthy of dignity and honor, incredibly valuable to the Lord. So live that way today. Speak that truth to one another. Live with yourself in a way that recognizes your value today. You deserve it because you were made in God's image. This is the, the big implication of this marvelous gospel. Right? And it is a marvelous message that God gives us. He died to save you because you're valuable to him. So we're going to close by saying how marvelous. How wonderful to save his love for me. Because he says you're worth that much. Hey, Elizabeth, would you come on up? God, I thank you for this really a familiar message. There's nothing new under the sun here. Nothing super creative. But it's a message, it's a truth that, that I think we uh, need to claim in greater ways personally and with each other. And God, it's a message that our world needs to hear. And we need to be champions of that message. Of, of really standing up for the least of these, not in a way that uses them for any agenda. But simply because they're made in your image and worth standing up for. Even the ones that, that may not have anything to offer us in return. I pray that Hopeful Church and that my brothers and sisters and myself would live. And so every human being around us, including ourselves, are made in the image of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
peace and remember that you are made in the image of God, that you are deeply loved, and that God, that he has given us this wonderful, marvelous gospel. Love you guys. See you soon.